So as we continue, let me say a few words about the topic of our discussion for, for today. Uh, many of you, all of you come uh, well prepared for it, and I will just pull some strands uh, together and then let Professor Kelsey uh, speak to us, um, and then our discussions will follow. First, a few comments about significance of faith. Significance of faith in the globalized world seems uh, obvious. Today is the anniversary of 9-11. And I thought it may be actually good for us to stop for a brief moment, not simply to reflect about significance of faith uh, demonstrated in that event, but also to think about lives lost about seven years ago, a little bit earlier than this time in the day. As Christians, we would probably say, may the light perpetual shine on them. Uh, other traditions might have different ways of expressing their own uh, wishes for the departed. But we are meeting on this day, right? And the destructive power of faith was obvious to all. Obviously, faith also has the power to inspire noble causes. And indeed, not just noble causes, but, causes, but practices and policies at the global level. Other case study, which we are examining in this course, Jubilee, is an example of that. But you may ask, is it really faith that's doing all the heavy lifting in these two cases and in similar cases as well? You know, there are theoretical counterarguments to that kind of a claim, you know. Faith, many people might claim, is epiphenomenal. It's derivative. In the last analysis, faith explains nothing in the world. Other things explain faith, but faith doesn't explain anything. Marx's faith is a sigh of the oppressed creature. Friedrich Nietzsche, kind of metaphysical expression of resentment. But even from that theoretical, critical perspective, um, the claim is not that faith is not causal. Claim is not faith doesn't cause ultimately anything, right? Marx would say it's opiate for the people. It offers false consolation. It does something. Nietzsche would say it is a weapon in the hands of the weak helps them control powerful, right? So you've got these uh, effects of faith even from the standpoint of somebody like Nietzsche or, uh, or Marx. But in addition to these possible theoretical objections, even, even the practical analysis of what has happened in 9-11, say, may suggest, well, political causes were more prominent and even if it's true that these were dressed more in a kind of religious garb for whatever reason, or at the economic level was significant, even if religion gave it additional motivation. Something like that can be, can be said. So um, that's a criticism possible of faith as causing something, but maybe it's too strong, maybe it would be wrong to put issue in terms of an alternative, either faith or something else. Faith need not be the sole cause or primary cause of events to qualify as significant force and deserve our attention. Indeed, one might argue that for such complex events as say 9-11 was and many others, all monocausal explanations are to be suspect in the first place. Religious convictions, uh, it suffices for religious convictions, for faiths to be one among many significant uh, causes. But then the question might be, well, well, how important are they if they're one among many? Are faiths as shapers of civilizations determinative for conflicts of the future, as Huntington has argued? Or is faith or are faiths a contributing element to events, positive, negative, whose main causes are non-religious? Or even you can ask the question, are faiths able to steer signif in significant ways large-scale processes such as globalization. You might even ask the question, are such, are such processes steerable? Is that a word? Well, it is now. <laughs> Can such processes be steered at all? Or do we live, as Anthony Giddens has suggested, in a runaway 
world? Or are fates there simply to tweak uh, one or the other aspect of the processes in, in one or the other direction? Now, certainly the focus of this course will not be relationship of faith to the globalization as a whole, but the functions of faith within the processes of globalization. Now, that's about significance of faith. Let me now say a few words about the ambivalence of faith. Now, we can grant for the sake of the argument that faiths are significant, but how do we appropriately evaluate from moral, or practical standpoint that significance. And I think that there's a number of ambivalences that can be noted. So I'll name them ambivalence one, two, three, and four for the lack of better description, right? So ambivalence one, some consider faith a force for good and some consider it as faith force for ill. Force for good believers especially, right? Those who believe that faiths are in some ways divinely revealed, such believers would claim that at least their faith, if not any other, <laughs> are a force for good. Many other folks who are not believers, I won't call them atheists because that strikes me as too negative of a way of putting things, or even non-religious people, maybe humanists may be a good term for um, those who are not believers in a particular religion, but even such people may consider faiths as high achievements of human spirit, achievements that sometimes malfunction, but achievements that are because they have endured over long periods of time, achievements that are a force for the good. Now, you may flip the thing and take the other side of the ambivalence and say, well, faith is a force for ill. And critics may argue that faith is by nature irrational. And irrationality is in principle and always uh, good, even if it might have immediate positive, uh, positive effects. Or critics may argue that faith is by its very nature violent, maybe partly because it's irrational, but even apart from it being irrational, faith has maybe, faith's, great faiths have at their center something like cosmic war, for instance. Other instances of such explanation of the violent nature of faith can be also adduced. adduced. That's the kind of ambivalence of faith from two different sides looking, folks looking at what faith does. But ambivalence can be also identified as people seeing in faiths both force for good and for ill and at the same time. Some people may not agree that faiths are force for both ill and good at the same time if at issue is something like the very nature of faith or God forbid that I use the word essence of faith uh, in today's academic environment, but something of the sort, what defines the very character of faith, right? They might not agree that faiths are ambiguous in this sense and ambivalent in this sense if we are dealing about the very essence of faith, but they may well agree that faith, uh, faiths are ambivalent if we take into account concrete faiths as they are lived in the world today, if we take into account lived experience of the people of faith throughout their history. And indeed, that's what we're gonna be looking at in this course. So that's ambivalence two. Ambivalence three is, this ambivalence stems from the fact that faiths themselves, or particular versions of faiths themselves, they provide interpretative lens by which to judge what is happening in the world uh, today. Take 9-11. I think it matters whether you share bin Laden's religious convictions and, considers, and consider all who disagree as apostates and infidels for, describing wh for deciding whether the attack on World Trade Center is to be described as deplorable violence or a just <coughs> struggle. Those perspectives uh, matter from where you stand. Or in terms of a jubilee, I think there was a one comment in our discussion sections, which I enjoyed very much, by the way. Uh, jubilee, it may matter whether you are a scientifically minded economist guided solely by utilitarian principles, or if you are a religious person who believes that we should feed the poor irrespective of the consequences of that action for future economic development. It may matter which, on which side you are in, in your judgment as to whether Jubilee initiative was a salutary thing or was in some ways deeply problematic. 
Finally, fourth, ambivalence. There are internal debates within each religion. Each faith is not one stable thing, an unchanging thing, so as to be simply force for ill or force for good. Uh, it has developed over time. It has variety of expressions depending on large cultural environments in which it finds itself. And then the very specific uh, conditions, limited conditions, in which faith um, are at the given moment give also shape to, to faiths. That's a, a rather complex account of what individual faith is. And that creates its own ambivalences. Or each faith is internally differentiated. Indeed, many people say that faiths are always comprised uh, of kind of internally, um, uh, of traditions of argument uh, that go over periods of time. And there are um, significant debates that are raging within various faiths. Who legitimately speaks for traditions? Is the particular interpretation true or false? How does the interpretation fit the larger shape of faith or some of the faith's basic uh, convictions? So many debates that are going on within faiths, and often you can find because of these internal debates between, uh, within faiths that sometimes positions of two faiths, there are folks of who, who are members of two different faiths who are closer to one another than the folks who are members of a single faith, right? Precisely because these internal debates, which makes it possible also, I think, for traffic to go between faiths as that traffic and debate is going on within those faiths. So that's about the ambivalence, the complex character of the ambivalence of faith. Now our task today is to explore the significance and the ambivalence of faiths.